It was approaching elections and uh, obviously there was, as a lead up to the elections, a tense situation anyway. Um, there had been an accident, a bus had mowed down a couple of students um, who were waiting on the side of the road. They weren't even in the road from what I gather. Um, and it led to initially a protest by the school students and then a much bigger protest um, all the way through. Um, that in itself, I mean, while it was very sad, one would not have expected to lead to you know, such a big uh, protest. Uh, I think there are two aspects to it. One is the fact that this had been going on for some time and uh, really nothing was being done about it, but there were a whole lot of other things. They had been uh, another set of protests prior to that by uh, young people who wanted jobs and of course there was the general situation within the country. So I think it was a tinderbox waiting to be lit. Um, so when it did happen, it basically paralyzed the country. The kids took to the streets, they started checking all the things that were happening, you know, stopping government cars, ministers' cars, and finding out that many of them did not have proper documentation. They, they were, you know, drivers didn't have licenses, cars didn't have fitness certificates, and things like that. But um, the government initially said they were going to look into it, but because um, in the previous instance they had made a similar promise, promise and reneged on it, this time the students were going to go back off. Um, while this was going on, then essentially government goons, uh, supposedly student groups affiliated to the government, they started attacking the students. Um, they were armed with machetes, with sticks, and the police were standing by, in some cases aiding and abetting. Um, so obviously it became very tense. That's when I was reporting on this. I was doing Facebook, well, I was reporting on Facebook Live. And um, on the 4th of August, I got attacked in the streets while I was doing this filming. And my camera smashed and I was hit. Um, I continued reporting. And the following day, I was going to give uh, an interview. I gave an interview to Al Jazeera. Um, I was at home alone, uploading the stuff. In fact, I was talking to uh, the BBC who were going to do an interview of me the following day. Um, the doorbell rang. I went to answer the door. Um, I saw a woman with short hair on the other side of the peephole saying, Uncle Shahidal, you know, whatever. And, you know, ours is a bit of an open house. Uh, people come and go. My partner has many people who come to her. I have many. Um, and I didn't think anything about it. I thought she'd come for my partner. Um, so I opened the door. And as I did, there were a whole bunch of people who were out of view, obviously lurking on the side, who came in and just made a grab for me. Now, I know the Bangladeshi situation well enough to realize what was going on. And at that time, my major concern was, because I was on my own, I could have been taken away and no one would know what had happened. Um, so I screamed, I resisted, I tried to delay the process as much as I could. Uh, but of course, they clearly overpowered me, took me down. There was a waiting van outside. I d later discovered they were a large number of vehicles outside and perhaps 30 to 35 people. Um, but they shoved me into the van. I tried to resist. Um, they handcuffed me uh, behind my back, blindfolded me, and then drove me away. Um, so roughly, that's what happened. Prison actually came later because uh, initially I was picked up, um, then I was tortured, uh, then the following day I was taken to the police headquarters and they made, offered me a deal. Um, you, we forget everything, it's all control delete, we drop you home, um, nothing on the records, you stay quiet. Um, I turned down the deal. Um, and they, they said, you know, they had threatened me before about not only what happened, but what was going to happen, what was going to happen to my family and all those sort of things. But it wasn't a position I was prepared to accept. 
Uh, I then got taken to court. In court I said what, what had happened. I then got taken into what is called remand. Uh, this is a euphemism used in Bangladesh uh, for being under police custody, which can be very dangerous. Um, I was given, the court ordered seven days remand. On the sixth day, I got taken initially to the court and then to jail. Um, the records say that I was, uh, I, I was taken to the court itself, but in fact, I was on the grounds of the court, I, I, um, in the premises, uh, and I went from the police vehicle to the prison van. I never actually entered the court itself. And then uh, I realized what was going to happen once I was in a prison van. Um, uh, and eventually I landed up in Karanagonj, it's quite a long way. Um, and then it started with me being you know, recorded and whatever. But people recognized me, people recognized me uh, in the prison van, um, they recognized me in jail and what normally happens is you go to a place called Amdani which is um, where the initial um, prisoners, prisoners are put in right at the beginning and that's where people are sold from. Um, I, that was short-circuited in my case. I didn't go to Amdani, I didn't go to a ward, I went directly to a cell. It was a shared cell but when I got to the building itself, again, prisoners there recognized me. And it was prisoners who really took after, looked after me all the way through, from that period right till the end. And while the situation in jail is what it is, uh, I think in relative terms, I was treated very well by the prisoners, and the prisoners ensured that the jailers treated me well. And um, really through their network, I. Of course, you're incarcerated and you're cut off from many things, but by and large, all that I could have possibly had while I was in jail was given to me uh, by the prisoners' network. That's amazing. The first thing I realized was when I was taken to the police headquarters, um, I, there were television sets, and I could see that uh, on the ticker, uh, ticker tape, news about my incarceration was there, there were n news bulletins and things like that, so I knew the news was, well, actually, um, it's even before that. Uh, when I'm taken to court, on the way to court, I saw my students outside where I'd been detained, so I later found out they'd been there all night, um, so they knew uh, what was going on, and that for me was the first, um, you know, good news if you like because up till that point I didn't really know whether where I was or what was happening to me was known to anyone. Um, then um, in court I actually had a chance to talk to my lawyers. Um, they didn't feel that it would go to this. They, they actually thought at that time that I would be released that night on bail. I wouldn't go to jail. Um, that didn't work out but um, uh, while I was when I was in prison, again using the prisoners network, I was able to send out a message to my family to let them know where I was. And then later they came to visit me. Um, the visit itself is across three bars. They're on the other side, I'm on this side. The noise is absolutely deafening. Uh, I, I'm told it's something like 130 decibels. You, can, you cannot hear across it, but that's, that's all there was. Um, but what they were able to tell me uh, was that there had been really this massive outcry all across the globe by then, even, even by that time, um, and uh, which was very heartening. Uh, they wanted to know how I was. I obviously was concerned much more about their situation. Uh, we got very little information through. We managed to set up a system where we could tell, uh, I mean, they could tell me when they would visit me next. Um, and there was, a, and my partner would visit me every day, early in the morning. Um, one morning she wasn't there and I got very, very worried because um, inside I'm safe in relative, I'm not, it's unlikely I will be cross-fired or disappeared when I'm in jail. 
outside you don't know. And I've been told uh, of what is likely to happen to them. I knew they were vulnerable. Uh, I wasn't there to help either. And um, I know my partner well enough that if she says she's going to come at a particular time, she will. For her not to be there, for my, not to know what has happened, was very, very worrying for me at that time. Um, eventually I did find out, but later when, since I've come out and I've spoken, I, I tried to tell her not to come every day because it's a long trek and she was going through so much anyway. Um, but she absolutely insisted and then later she told me, I don't trust them. I needed to see you every day to know that you were okay. I needed to see with my own eyes. And you know, that, that pressure of not knowing what was happening to me, what might happen to me. Um, and when it was distinctly at that time um, not safe to be Shahidul friendly. So a lot of people who would otherwise have been part of the support structures had moved away. Significantly, there were others who did quite the opposite. They made sure they were there all the time, kept up, uh, asked if money was needed, food was needed, shelter was needed, all of those sort of things. But even so, it was very, very difficult. And uh, that entire process is something we've had to reflect upon in, in the sense that uh, now my lawyers tell me that I should get psychiatric treatment, I should be, you know, someone should check to see what the post-trauma effects are. No one has said that about them. And I can see from seeing them every day what they have gone through and what they continue going through. The fact that I'm here, you know, we're not together is, is one thing, but also uh, they know my lifestyle. I mean, be a partner. So uh, I go around on a bicycle, I talk to people along the streets, I do what I do. I'm, I'm a very independent person anyway. Um, Knowing that this is something I completely detest, uh, I've been told you will not go on a bicycle, you will not go on your own, you will not carry a mobile phone, you will constantly let us know where you are, how you are, and, and be reporting, and there will be no communication gap. Now, that seriously impinges upon the type of work I do, my, my lifestyle, and it's no way would they be saying that to me if they didn't know that there was no option. But I can see, you know, there are times and you're not able to get that message across because you're relaying it through someone or whatever else and it doesn't happen, you slip. And I can see what happens every time that happens, that the shackles go up, what's going on, what if. Uh, and that's a fear we live with constantly.